Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today's program will be an open-ended conversation with Whitley Strieber. Whitley is the author of A New World. Well, I interviewed him about A New World some six months ago and recently heard from a new publisher who has picked up the book and uh, suggested a new interview with Whitley. And rather than repeat the interview we did earlier, we've decided to just uh, see where the conversation takes us. It could go in almost any direction. Whitley, of course, is famous for his best-selling book, uh, Communion a true story about an alien encounter he experienced in 1985. Since then, he's written many follow-up books about the same experience and the, and the ramifications of it in his life, including Breakthrough, The Next Step, Solving the Communion Enigma, What is to Come, The Key, A True Encounter, the Secret School, Preparation for Contact, Transformation, The Breakthrough. He's also the co-author with his late wife, Ann Streber, of The Communion Letters. The truth is out there for those who dare to read it and The Afterlife Revolution. In addition, he is the co-author with Professor Jeffrey Kripal of the Supernatural, A New Vision of the Unexplained. And he wrote the introduction to a book by Jacques Vallée called Dimensions, A Casebook of Alien Contact. In addition, he's written horror stories and novels, including Wolfen, uh, which was made into a movie. And, uh, of course, other movies have been made from his books as well. He's also written about the environment. So, who knows where our conversation will go today. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Whitley. I'm very happy to be with you once again. Well, it's always a great pleasure, Jeff, to be with you. So, I'm looking forward to our time together. Well, this is an open-ended conversation, and uh, I thought I'd begin by asking you, at this very moment, or let's say today or this week, what is uh, exciting you the most? The whole phenomenon, which we've talked about many times, and in which, in fact, has been most of my life, is gradually coming into focus both in my life and in um, and in the world in general. And when I say coming into focus, uh, there is a kind of decision being made at some level in the human mind about what this is going to be for us. And you can see manifestations of it in the uh, work that Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal are doing in the New York Times um, the efforts of TTSA to uh, add some kind of a, if not official, then certainly a professional locomotion to it when it comes to the intelligence community. And then there is the close encounter aspect of it, which I live with, and most of certainly my readers do too. And this is where one begins to wonder what the focus, which is very definitely nuts and bolts and machinery on the part of uh, the New York Times. And although I wouldn't think that if asked, Leslie and Ralph would say that that was, in their opinion, the beginning and end of it. But I think it probably is pretty much to the military and the intelligence community and, and the TTSA people whom some of whom I know and respect enormously, uh, I've known Hal Putoff for 30 years, uh, do come at it from pretty much of a, of a physical object's point of view. Although I have to say that given the size of the, the little Tic Tacs um, in, in, um, that were photographed, or rather picked up on radar, 
off the carrier Nimitz in a few years ago. And video. And video, yeah. Uh, the, if whatever would be in them would have to be really very, very small indeed. So I have a feeling that that we really don't understand what's going on. You know, I knew of man, he was a psychologist called John Glideman, also a physicist. He was the husband of a, a wonderful a woman you may remember, Margot Adler, the uh, author of Drawing Down the Moon. And he was, Margot and John were very, very close friends during the communion period and right before it. And they spent many, many nights up at our cabin in upstate New York. And John and I used to just speculate endlessly about what was going on. And we saw things, strange things together and had a generally wonderful time about it. We even came up with an idea called the refrigerator factor at some point where we thought that perhaps the low frequency sounds being emanated by the refrigerator were causing me to have seizures. <laughs> We tried everything anyway, but, um, we concluded, and, and this was a sort of conclusion from observations that this is something that has a presence in the physical world, like a presence on an, on an Island, uh, that isn't necessarily its point of origin. And I'm aware of the fact that the military has had a considerable amount of difficulty with this. Uh, there, I can tell from, from uh, some of the things I've heard and, and, and from reliable people that there have been confrontations and um, that there is a, a desire to create some kind of a defensive response, which I understand perfectly. Uh, however, as I pointed out in these same discussions, we're in the position of a dog being bothered by somebody with a boot and who's the dog is concentrating on biting the toe of the boot and hasn't any real relationship or understanding of the connection, uh, with the man up there high in the sky who's laughing down at him as he struggles. And I, I said to them, you know, very frankly, if you look at the, uh, one of the great generals of history, Belisarius, who recaptured the boot of Italy for the Roman empire, which had lost Italy in completely at that point in time. And he did it with a very small army and he did it by the use of indirection. He was always crossing the supply lines of the barbarian soldiers when they least expected it and ending up behind them or on their flanks. And was quite clever in that he would uh, sometimes manage to appear to be on one flank but actually be on the other. So he, he really rolled them right off the boot of Italy very quickly quickly. And then Theodoric got jealous of him and had him killed. But, um, th you know, that was life in those days, short, terribly interesting, and mostly quite unpleasant. But in any case, uh, we don't, we, we don't have that, that, that the luxury of that kind of approach. All we can do is nibble at the boot at the toe of the boot. So if we do, make a military confrontation out of it, we're going to lose. We'll eventually just get tired and, uh, like the dog skulk off or curl up and go to sleep. Or, uh, perhaps the boot will become whoever owns the boot will become angry enough to really beat us up. No way to tell. But I don't think that chomping at the boot is the way to go. Even, even given that there is a physical aspect to this and that it is perceived to be hostile, if, if that is indeed the case. You know, what you're saying reminds me of a conversation that we released just uh, 
a few days ago, actually, with one of my guests, a fellow named Doug Marmon, who practices uh, a discipline called soul travel. He's a, a member of a, a religious group you've probably have heard of called Ekenkar. And he was describing to me the astral plane and the relationship between the astral plane and the physical plane. And he said he, he thinks this has something to do with abductions and, and the phenomenology. And uh, to it, give me an illustration of what he meant, he talked about a time when his wife came home from work and she had had a bad day at work. Uh, a lot of office politics going on and she felt exhausted and she asked if, if he would massage her, which he did. And he said he could see with his astral eyes a knife stuck in her back. And he reached out both with his physical hand and he said his astral hand and removed the knife from her back. And at that point she said to him, what did you just do? And, uh, he, he explained to her and she said the, uh, the pain had gone away instantly, uh, when he did that. Uh, so it suggests that there is this complex, indefinable relationship between some other realm that in his tradition they would call the astral plane and, and what we call the physical plane. This is one of the reasons that the military is going to have trouble. Uh, but, but it's a very serious problem. Uh, the reason being that if you if you shoot, you get into difficulty. And let me give you an example of this. Um, in Kathleen Marden's book about um, abductions that recently published, she has a story which I repeat in a new world. With of course, with attribution, Kathleen is a good friend, and about a man who had a, a a private airport, a little airport, and he lived in the hangar. You don't necessarily you're not necessarily rich if you have a little bitty airport, and charge people twelve dollars to land or whatever. So, he lived in the hangar, in a room in the hangar, and one night, he noticed a flying saucer at the end of his runway. And so he got some light sticks and various things and began to make a place on the runway that indicated his willingness for them to land. And they came back. They, they came back a good deal. And then one night, he was awakened by sounds in the hangar and looked out of his little room to see these, what he regarded as horrifying creatures in his hangar. Of course, it was the little grave folk and uh, who had come, since he was saying, come meet with us, they came. Um, they did that to me once and scared me half to death too, but I fortunately didn't take the same direction he did, which was he Either that night or the next night, I forget which, he ended up in a situation. No, no, they went away, but he got a gun. And one of them ended up at the foot of his bed. And he took the gun out and shot him, shot it. Whereupon it blew up into smithereens of green fluid and disappeared. Then he was haunted by an infuriated and malevolent spirit version of the being. In other words, he had broken its, uh, its the, the machine with which it made itself present in the physical world, and now it was furious at him. And eventually he died, actually. He was completely undone by it, but not before... He and his mother saw at the end of the runway one afternoon, or I'm, I'm, I'm not, please don't, if I'm wrong about the details of the time, please forgive me. But one day, another world, and they could see mammoths in it. 
and it, it, soon after he he died and of and he was destroyed essentially by an overwhelming uh intrusion of this other level of reality into his life and so the lady whose husband had the ability to see one of those manifestations on her body and remove it is a lucky woman indeed because most mostly we can't see that sort of thing the other night about a week ago a week and a half ago now i have a lot of manifestation in this apartment it's completely ordinary to my life and it doesn't uh, i'm not concerned by it in other words i'm not shocked when a semi-visible individual shows up in this place and has a conversation with me at all or even completely physically visible it, it really isn't shocking and and it's i consider it to a, a, a lucky break to have a life like this so in any case I woke up in a pretty unusual situation uh, uh, was was unfolding. The apartment was filled with um, thick black, what looked like a, a sort of a sort of a spider web at about chest level that filled the entire apartment and was punctuated by little puck like areas in it which were glowing faintly orange and i thought to myself i sat up in bed and i thought now now we're getting somewhere this is probably really is an alien <laughs> and i thought can i move through this and i reached out and pushed at it and it had a it had a very slight resistance so and it, and when i would push through it it would simply return to its original form so it was my time, it was three o'clock in the morning, the time I usually meditate. And I thought, well, I'll go out and do my meditation. I'll meditate with the spider web thing. And so I kind of walked through it and went to sit down. And when I sat down to meditate, it immediately disappeared. And I did my meditation and uh, went back to bed after a while and everything was completely normal the next day. I have no idea what it was. I don't know what happened. Uh, it wasn't uh, dangerous, apparently, unless I explode in a few weeks for some unknown reason, then we'll know that it was. But my point is this. He sees into a very richly alive level of reality that has a completely different relationship with form and presumably, therefore, also with function than this one does. But it's so close to here that there are conditions in which a person in living in this level of reality can see it and interact with it. He took out the knife. I dealt with the web. I think we're basically we're in the same level of reality or something or a level very close. And I think it's quite real. And I think it might be much bigger than this. Much bigger. I think it might be much bigger, much more complex. And I think it also might be much more generally conscious and possibly intelligent. So uh, here we are in our little bassinet called Earth in this made of amazing ancient uh, 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 presence, the nature of which we cannot even guess at, let alone understand it on a functional level or even a philosophical level really we've got an inner reality of our consciousness and an external reality that we experience through our senses and and they interact with each other in mysterious ways philosophers have been trying to figure that out for centuries without much luck uh, but I think the inner reality is probably at least as large as the outer reality. I'm inclined to think the inner reality ultimately encompasses the outer reality. Our outer reality is a, is a little small reality. And what we see as an inner reality is actually a window into something absolutely vast uh, and um, uh, filled with 
life teeming with life of a kind or of many different kinds, which lives and functions by rules that are entirely foreign to us, because I don't think it necessarily is in the time stream flowing with time as we are. We are like, um, and I'm not even sure we're real. I have to tell you, we are bodies that are so richly endowed with biology that we are welded to the flow of time. And I often thought to myself, perhaps these, are, these aren't even real. Perhaps these are projections. One of the first things my wife said after she came back, after she died, was, Whitley, it's a game. And <laughs> I think it might be. I'm not so sure it's a particularly fun game, but it's, <laughs> it may be very well a game. But, you know, getting back to the philosophical issue that you brought up, which is, of course, absolutely fascinating to me, uh, there are two ways of looking at the situation that I think are productive. The first is one that has been recently coming back into fashion and philosophy after being dismissed for many years as being just too platonic, which is Plato's cave. And, in, of course, in Plato's cave, we are the, 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 the people viewing the quote-unquote reality of Plato's cave are chained to their seats and looking at a screen, a light is coming from behind and images are unfolding on the screen uh, that are being generated by a presence that they can't directly perceive and they are in the belief that what they are perceiving is reality when in fact it is not. It is, as Anne said, a game. However, every once in a while, someone gets up and turns around and looks into the light. And when that happens, you, you get burned, but you also get enlightened, literally. And the stories of enlightenment across history are all stories of people who got up and turned around. And when I'm, when I'm in the situation of being with someone who has died and who is trapped in this level and is trying, looking for help, sometimes they come to me. They come to a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of your listeners were nodding and saying, yes, that's happened to me. And in fact, at the Monroe Institute, there's even a course in how to help people like this. Um, but you have to learn to how to turn them around. Because to them, everything is exactly the same as it is now. In other words, they die, they come out of their physical body, and they think, well, wait a minute, now what? I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing left here, but uh, I'm still in my house. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And, and that's when they need help. Now, so that's one thing, Plato's Cave. The other thing is more interesting in one sense in that it's a modern idea. It comes from Edmund Gettier, who proposed it in 1963 in a little wonderful, brilliant three, four page paper. Um, at the time, uh, philosophy was, was absorbed in the idea that could, there could be truth that there could be something that was seen that was that could be said to be true and rules were being formulated as to what would be something that we could consider generally to be true and edmund gethe came out with a paradox and i will paraphrase it but accurately enough now uh it's the cow problem there is a farmer the farmer has a black and white Hereford cow, which he's concerned about the cow. And so he isolates the cow in a field by herself in the field. There are, it's an empty field, except for two features. There is a tree in the field and there is a little hollow in the field. If the cow was in the hollow, he would not be able to see the cow, but the cow is not feeling well and isn't wandering around much. 
So every once in a while, while he's working during the day, he looks in the field to be sure the cow is all right. While he's busy with his other cows, a piece of black and white paper blows into the field and gets caught under the tree in the branches. Meanwhile, the cow does wander into the hollow. The cow is all right at this point. He glances into the field, sees the black and white paper under the tree, and thinks, ah, the cow is all right. He is right and wrong at the same time. He is right. The cow is fine. He is wrong. He does not, in fact, see the cow. I would submit that is the most fundamental description of the experience of being that has ever been devised. We do not know what we do not know, as I believe Donald Rumsfeld once said. <laughs> I so enjoy these ideas and these little problems. You know, since you're bringing up so many different things, the spiritual world, the question of uh, life after death, uh, communication with aliens uh, all at once, uh, if you don't mind, Whitley, I'd like to push a little further now because uh, you mentioned earlier that you recently have completed a manuscript has to do with Jesus Christ. And, and I think... Uh, that's that's a piece of the puzzle that's uh, w worth discussing. It's an, an entirely new vision, and I I can assure you that as soon as it's published or shortly thereafter, it is going to infuriate everyone except the searchers who have seemingly come to the end of the Jesus story. It that is not. In, in fact, where we are, the Jesus story has never been told before. It has, the book has nothing whatsoever to do with aliens. I don't believe Jesus was an alien. I don't believe he was someone from another planet. I think he was from here. And I think his story is among the most important human stories that are, have ever been told. Uh, he had such a fascinating and strange thing happen to him that for whatever reason, and I get into this very deeply in the book as to why this would be, after he was put in the tomb, a few of his close associates had experiences of him that changed them profoundly. Their rabbi had been ignominiously murdered by the Romans in a particularly humiliating way. And being his disciple was now dangerous as per, because one of the charges against him, which you can, you can find if you are careful and look past the dreadful attempts in the in the canonical gospels, especially to blame the Jews for something the Romans in fact did. Uh, if you look past that, you find that he was, was executed for sedition, which is a terribly dangerous crime was a dangerous crime in Rome uh, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in that world, if you said something seditious in the hearing, say of a soldier, he could drag you off and, crucify you on a tree and no one would say a thing about it. So, and then, but suddenly these men, after this disaster has occurred, believe that they have seen him and believe it so intensely that they go out into the world to proclaim it to everybody, despite the danger to their own lives, and in fact the ruin of their lives, and every single one of them did die of this and was ruined by it. And then St. Paul comes along, his name is Saul, he's a Romanized Jew, uh, uh, possibly a Mithraic, uh, at least he certainly knows a great deal about the Mithraic cult, which is unknown in the Roman Empire, by the way, at that time. It was forbidden in Persia, where it started. 
The only place that it's still being practiced is in Tarsus, which happens to be the city Paul came from. He's walking along to Damascus, and an extraordinary thing happens to him. He's blinded by a light, and it completely transforms his life. And the next thing you know, he is marching across uh, the, the Roman world, uh, spouting out some of the most sophisticated and extraordinary the theology that has to this day ever been uttered by anybody or written down, including, of course, some things that were not so nice by our standards, but nevertheless, uh, an extraordinary transformation of this man. Now, what happened to these people. If you look back all the way to Akhenaten, the first sun worshiper that we know of who, who uh, uh, organized a theology of sun worship in um, ancient Egypt and uh, fomented a revolution in the Egyptian religion and was eventually destroyed for it. Then you look at Zoroaster who was attracted to the idea of the one God by a, by a glowing figure walked up to him while he was searching for the truth in the wilderness. Moses, who was attracted to the same thing by a light in a burning bush. And there are quite a few others. In fact, you realize something. Light, some kind of light, has been drawing a oh, Muhammad in his cave with the glowing angel has been drawing human beings toward the idea of a single God for thousands of years and then uh, amplifying it into a, a, uh, uh, uh uh, an executable theology when Paul met it. Now, Paul was helped to go into Damascus, now blind, and in a few weeks he recovered, and he comes out transformed and now uh, 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 with, with an extraordinary story to tell and a highly sophisticated theology. Where did he learn it? He was not a Christian. He knew he couldn't have known much about Jesus. He was as he persecuted. He was the, the first martyr. St. Stephen was killed at Paul's hands. So who was there? Who taught him? And who, when Jesus went into Jerusalem and the palms were all laid, who organized that? Jesus said to go and you would find a donkey in Bethsaida and uh, or a little colt for him to ride on. And he said, reassure the local people, if they are, ask you about it, that it will be returned. So the local people didn't know anything about this animal. Who did? Somebody put it there. Uh, who was the boy who was so uh, desperate to get away at the Garden of the Gethsemane that he threw off his linen tunic and ran off into the dark buck naked who was that who was the man at the sitting at the at the tomb when the women came who was that who were these people we don't think about any of that someone organized the crowd that 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 met jesus as he came into jerusalem it wasn't all just spontaneous the Gospels simply leave that all out. And what about the Shroud of Turin? It was woven in a way that we know that cloths that were worn by the Essenes were woven. So who were they really? There's even some scholarship that suggests they didn't exist. But I think they did exist. And I think it's a fair question to ask, what in the world did they know? And who were they? And why is light of some kind, apparently conscious light, so interested in how we think about deity. So those are some of the things I go over in the book. Well, there are many other examples of light influencing people. Yes, yes. 
John D. comes to mind. John D., did you say? I didn't hear you. John D., the court astrologer for Queen Elizabeth. Yes. I, I didn't move that that far into the present because I was I was dealing in the book with the ancient world, but you're quite right. But this light is is there and it and it has a purpose. And also it is by far the most important cultural influence in most of the world. It is I mean his Islam came out of it, uh, Judaism came out of it, Christianity came out of it. It's immensely influential, immensely influential. So what is it? I wonder if there isn't a, a relationship between light and uh, the absence of light, uh, which we call darkness. I mean, for example, the Buddha meditated and uh, described a state of nirvana, a state of nothingness where, where there was no light. But I wonder what it really is, that state it's, I, I understand that state very well. I've lived in that state, and I'm, I don't consider myself as being in nirvana because I always think of nirvana as being something really, really blissful, and it's a very deep and, in a sense, challenging state uh, because you gradually you lose contact with, with your ego, with your self, and you begin to see it from a distance from the outside and it it fades away like a little spark going off into the distance and you are embraced by a wilderness of darkness i would say that's the way to describe that feeling uh that experience in deep 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 meditation and um I don't know that it's, I've read Buddha's descriptions of his experiences, and I don't know if it's the same or not, but it, you know, I, it's not around to ask. We can't compare notes, so I, I can't be sure. But um, certainly it's in that direction. You mentioned that you, you've completed this manuscript. I'm sure it'll be published before long. Uh, about Jesus, and it has no mention of uh, the alien experiences for which you are so strongly identified in the public. What what was it that inspired you to begin this project? Oh, the visitors, of course. <laughs> it was the next thing, um, and they promised me it was the last book that I would be finished then, and so uh, I started working on it and the research was wonderful. I found myself able to recapture my rusty youthful Greek, which was really important to do because you can't really do this sort of thing without reading Greek because it's so much more of a language than English or goodness, you know, uh, the King James version of the Bible, which is all of the English language Bibles or rest on it in one way or another was translated from the Latin Vulgate. And, uh, you have a word like verbum, uh, it, which is in it, at the beginning of John in the beginning, uh, was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Um, but the problem is the Greek is not verbum. It's not word. It's logos. And logos is one of the richest words in the Greek language and has many meanings, among them harmony, principle. And so when someone read those words in, the, in, in Greek in the old days, they didn't read the word as word. They read it as something else, probably, I think, harmony. Uh, because the whole gospel is, in a sense, about uh, r uh, recovering harmony, because it is uh, it is written in opposition to what we now know as the Thomas Gospel, uh, the Sayings Gospel of Thomas. Uh, and at the time, since the Sayings Gospel was all they were all burned, we didn't know until it was rediscovered at Nag Hammadi and. Uh, 1947 that it even existed 
But Doubting Thomas in the John Gospel is the author of the Thomas Gospel, Jesus' twin. But this is a very, very complicated situation. And incidentally, if you read the Gospels carefully, you find very quickly that most of the claims in them that relate to Jesus as Messiah are false. And in fact, in, after, after he rose from the dead again, Jesus said that he had, that he had r- risen according to Scripture, uh, and that is taken to mean that he was indeed the Messiah. But there's nothing in Jewish Scripture and in, in Torah about the, the Messiah having to die and be reborn. But there's a great deal in the pagan uh, mythology about the sun god in his many different forms, dying and being reborn. In fact, the reality is that if you strip away the few attempts to reconcile the Jesus story with the Messiah prophecies, what you have is a story of the sun god. And in fact, Adonis uh, was worshipped in Bethlehem, and the cave in which Jesus was supposedly born was the same cave in which Adonis had been born, supposedly, of his mother Aphrodite. The uh, Magi, who were worshippers of the sun god, bringing myrrh to honor Jesus after following a star, myrrh was uh, the consort of Adonis. So it was a sacrifice to Adonis that they enacted, that became, was simply tacked on to the Jesus story. (laughs) It's fascinating, isn't it? This is all very fascinating and rich with material, but I'd like to come back to one point you you mentioned earlier that uh, puzzled me. You said Thomas was Jesus's twin. He is characterized as that in John. Hmm. I don't think that the word Thomas, uh, I think there are numerous, as I go into in my, in, in, in the, in, in my new book, ways of, uh, looking at that name, uh, and, 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 because it's not a name, it's a, it's a, it's a word. It, it's means twin or like, uh, another thing that, I mean, it, it, and and it, it says that this, this is the gospel of Thomas Didymus. Didymus is twin in Greek. Thomas is twin in, in Aramaic. So, you know, it's the gospel of twin twin. Uh, there's a lot of absurdity in the Thomas gospel, a lot of contradictions. At one point, Jesus in the Thomas gospel says, don't pray and uh, don't give to charity. He says the opposite of everything he said in the Beatitudes. And this is probably one of the reasons all the books were eventually burned because they forgot what this was about, that Jesus was not a God to be worshiped uncritically, but a teacher who would challenge you if you tried to believe him uncritically in the Thomas gospel, he would turn his whole teaching around and drop it on your head, which is what he does in the Thomas gospel, which is why it makes it so wonderful. Any searcher, a uh, real searcher, going into this has to come out with two Gospels, all both found at Nag Hammadi, the Mary Gospel and the Thomas Gospel. And they are incredibly rich troves of contradiction and insight made for the mind and soul of a searcher to engage with. It's very interesting that the uh, Nag Hammadi Library was discovered in 1947. I believe that's also the year of the uh, UFO flap around uh, Mount Rainier. It is the year of Roswell. It is a year of fundamental change. You know, in I believe it's in Revelation, Jesus says that if I am not understood that when I return, I will come like a thief. In other words, I will come sneaking in 
And when the first photograph of the Shroud of Turin was taken in 1898, suddenly we saw that something very strange was present there. <clears throat> and then in 1947, a year of profound change, this other material was discovered that enables us that, that the tooth that these things taken together enable us to take a completely fresh look at the whole idea of Jesus. I think he's already come back as a thief, in fact, and I think those are the incidents that 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 represent the return. Um, by the way, the 1988 Shroud of Turin debunking was fallacious, uh, and I can easily show that in the book. It's not difficult at all anymore. Uh, they, they, it was, uh, the man who designed the, the project set out to be sure that it would not provide an accurate dating. And in any case, because of certain aspects of the shroud and, and its condition, it's now known that carbon dating cannot provide a, pro a proper dating for the shroud. Uh, so, and I go into that also very deeply in the book. I'm not saying I know what it is, but I am saying that it wasn't, it wasn't a medieval forgery. Speaking of the, this connection between uh, the visitors and religion, which, which you've enunciated now, uh, it, I'm reminded of Carl Jung's book, Flying Saucers, in, in which he saw this round uh, lights in the sky as uh, signifying the birth of a new religion some kind of rather misbegotten thing has kind of slouched toward Bethlehem, hasn't it? <laughs> In the form of the Space Brothers and the, the, the Galactic Federation and all of those fantasies, the awful lizard men and the quixotic little greys and the big trolls and all of that. Um, it's all very confused, isn't it? Uh, I don't think that, and I think back to the Heaven's Gate disaster and what happened there and how they, they, um, came to believe things that we are not really capable of understanding and they decided they did understand them. We've been doing that for too long. One thing my book does, my new book does fight about against is belief. Belief. Annie said one of the wisest things I've ever heard. She said, the human species is too young to have beliefs. What we need are good questions. <laughs> if my books, if, if my whole life has a theme, that's the theme from communion to a new world to the new book which will be out shortly, by the way, I've quit the publishing business. Uh, in other words, I don't, th there's no point in my sending my book to publishers. They won't buy it. And, um, because Whitley Strieber has become persona non grata because I'm an, I'm Mr. UFO, the rectal probe man, as far as they're concerned. <laughs> so, uh, I will publish it myself and beautifully just as I did afterlife revolution and a new world. And, and now one publisher beyond word has taken up a new world and is republishing it in paperback. So go to the, go to the, wherever you get books and you'll be able to find it. And maybe they'll do the same thing with the new book. Which is the occasion for our conversation today. As a matter of fact, they reached they reached out to me. Yeah. Well, I, I obviously see you differently. You're uh, a very probing intellect. And it seems to me that uh, you're asking deep philosophical questions. And, and uh, although you, you seem to be identified in the minds of many people as a storyteller or a true believer, I see you actually uh, as, as something of a, a legitimate, authentic skeptic. That is uh, very refreshing to hear someone say that. My wife and I were both very skeptical. And we ended up in a situation where our lives 
simply flew in the face of our skepticism and swept it away in a great tide of unknowing. Um, the, the, for, you know, the cloud of unknowing in our lives was a tsunami of unknowing. And um, after she passed away, for example, she began to come back first to friends. And it, 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 I was sitting in the living room at 9.30 that night, and she died at 7.15. And I cannot tell you how bereft I was because she was a, an immense presence. Uh, she was brilliant beyond anyone I have ever known uh, with a huge mind and a, a very extraordinarily gl global capability in her thought processes. She could think big thoughts. And so I was sitting there feeling as if the biggest part of my mind had disappeared. And I was thinking, Annie, if you exist at all in any way, I must, you must, you must let me know somehow. The phone rang and I thought, my God, I cannot imagine answering the phone. And yet it was a friend of Anne's. And I, no one knew it. Just a few people knew at that point that anything at Anne had died. And this woman didn't know she couldn't have, I don't think. So the next thing I knew, I answered the phone and she said, Whitley, it's bell. And I, something odd just happened. I just heard Anne say in my ear to call Whitley, is she all right? She knew bell. Anne was sick. Of course and I said, no, she's not all right. Bell. She died a little while ago. And that was the first of many such calls. And then I remembered that we had talked about back in the nineties when Anne had realized that the whole close encounter experience and the reappearance of the dead friends and relatives in people's lives were connected. She'd said, well, you know, if there is such a thing as an afterlife, let's make a pact. We'll come back if we can and contact other people, not each other, because if you, you try to contact me, Whitley, I'll never believe it. And I know you won't either. And I, that was quite true. I, but once she, this had started to happen after a week or so, I realized that she was still here. And I think the first word to me that I really heard her say was finally, <laughs> oh no, she didn't say that. She said, you threw away my socks. And I had planned on removing her things from the house, but I decided not to. And I bought an entire set of identical socks and put them in her drawer and everything she had is still exactly where it was. Nothing has been changed in this apartment since that moment. Um, but they are real, the dead. She, she said, one of the things she said was, and I think it's quite true is I'm not Anne anymore, but I will always be Anne for you, which was a very loving thing to say. And, um, so, you know, uh, that all resulted in the afterlife revolution and an, and an entire life where all of our skepticism has been simply pounded by undeniable strange experiences. The thing that strikes me the most about uh, this story of, of your ongoing communications with Anne is uh, the importance of love here, that love seems to be the, the bridge between the, the physical world and, and the world of, depart, of the departed. I think that love is absolutely critical. I learned from the visitors that a strong soul, there are three pillars, love, compassion, and humility. And they took me on a long teaching journey or I should say for me, it was a learning journey in all three directions, starting with humility early on when I was just getting to know them beyond b the idea that they were something really scary and creepy and, um, fr and, and, and brutal because of course I was badly in injured on the first night I was with them, uh, largely because I, um, 
flailed around a great deal and caused them. I, I don't think that they expected me to be that upset uh, because I, I don't think that they have the same, their, their understanding of what we're like is not fabulous. Not that they're aliens, but that just that their, their relationship to, to the world, to reality is so different that it's extremely difficult for them to make those kinds of connections. They don't feel the vulnerability that we feel. I'm quite sure of that. And the physical vulnerability. And so they, they, they were taken by surprise by my, my, um, reaction. And the result was I was injured in any case. Uh, they took me on this journey of this schooling and the, the first one is humility and then love and what it means to really love, to give yourself completely. And Annie used to say, and I think that's so true. She said, a good marriage is based on giving, not getting. You don't ever think about what you want. You think about what does my spouse want? What does my spouse need from me? And if both spouses think that way, then they're going to have a wonderful marriage. And I learned from her how to do that. And, and we did, we had a wonderful marriage because we were always, we always were ready to meet the needs of the other. I felt very, very secure in my marriage for that reason. And I know she did too. I still do. I don't think the marriage has ended. That's, I think I've said this to you before. That's why I wear both rings. I think we're, we're, we're still together, but just, we're just down to one body <laughs> presently. But this lesson about love came through your marriage. How, how did the visitors uh, teach you about love? That's a hard one to face because being in their school is not easy. It's extremely challenging. And what happened was, I, two things. One is, I was separated, profoundly separated from this world for a time. And getting back to it, and seeing my wife was the most intense and profound experience. I, one of the most intense and profound experiences I've ever had, seeing her looking up at me and saying innocently, did you have a good night? The answer was no, I had not had a good night at all. I'm not talking about the communion experience. I'm talking about something else, and I'm, I, I don't like to get into it too deeply. But suffice to say, I felt profoundly separated from humanity for a while and, and illustrated to me that we live in the arms of love. All of us do. We are all in love with ourselves as a species, with each other. We just do, we're like, we're like cats. We do a lot of fighting, but we still love each other dearly. And you, you, you have an experience like that and you never forget it. You love everyone you, you come into contact with, even though very often they make you angry and are cruel or whatever, or you fail in those ways. The, um, other thing was that one of these beings made me, I woke up in the middle of having a very powerful sexual experience with this entity in a room full of people. And I was so ashamed because I felt like I had violated my marriage vow. And, you know, I'm a person growing up in a Catholic background, I guess, and just being the way I am. If I make a vow, that's it. I made my vow, and that's final. I'm not going to go back on it. 
And so I, I had to take this shame to Annie and, and tell her what had happened. And she said, well, did you do it? Did you want to do it? Did you? And I said, no, I woke up in the middle of it. And she said, so it wasn't your fault. Was it fun? And I said, yeah, and it was fun. She said, well, good. Tell me about it. And I did. <laughs> so, it, but from things like that, you learn about love. And she used to say, Whitley, there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is when you get the new TV you've been longing to get. Joy is when you hold the baby in your arms and look in the baby's eyes. She would say, if you want to really grow as a soul, involve yourself with a baby because they're the best teachers in the world. And you know who else had that attitude? It was Jesus. He did too. He's commended in this and in, in, I point this out in the Jesus book. He commanded us, and there's a particularly extraordinary passage in the Gospel of Thomas, where he commends to us the importance of letting babies teach us. Because they have nothing, they have no impediments. They are pure We come trailing clouds of glory from we know not where, I think in Ode on Immortality for uh, Recollected, about the Wordsworth poem, uh, from God who is our home. We're all trying to go home. This whole universe, everything in it, every little, from every little protozoan, to every stone and star and every single soul, all of us, we're going home. Whitley, that is so beautiful. No, oh, it's true, too. You feel that in yourself if you let yourself think of it and you let yourself feel that. I once had an experience with um, a dog. I was meditating. And it was the after, in the afternoon, and I was doing the sensing exercise that I do so often. And by the way, people, if they, you want to go on my website, it's unknowncountry.com. You can learn all about it. Simplest exercise in the world, but really powerful. In any case, I was um, doing the sensing exercise, and suddenly in my mind's eye, this shaggy dog showed up. And I generally don't see too many things in my mind's eye when I'm doing the exercise. In fact, not, not often this, this uh, vividly. And it was not only was it a shaggy dog, it was a dog I knew called Quagmire. Quagmire had been the dog of a friend, a, a girlfriend when I was a teenager. And Quag had been, Quag was a shaggy, muddy dog. And the father of the family had had a very hard time in the Korean War and had PTSD, which we didn't know what it was in those days, and was prone to outbursts. And he would kick Quag all over the place and just beat him up, and Quag would often be limping and hurt, and but always happy, always ready to give all the love, his little old dog body. And... I told Ann this. I told her about Quagmire, and she said, Dog, God, you had a visit from God. <laughs> I said, Oh, my God, that's ridiculous. God's not going to show up as Quagmire. She said, Oh, yes, you just described the relationship between God and man very well. I said, Well, I'd have to have a sign to believe that. We went walking a little while later, and there on the, on the street was a car with a vanity plate, Q-G-M-I-R-E, quagmire. 
And I thought, my goodness, I did have a visit from God, Annie. She said, I told you. And so, you know, you have to understand God as a desperate presence in your life. Otherwise, you, you can't really live as a human, fully as a human being. You have to understand that there is desperate love all the time in your life. Someone is desperate in love with you and that's God and it's present everywhere in all of us and not just in the human being but in everything you have to get you have to get close to the desperation of God if you're going to go ahead any, any very far in this journey this soul journey I think I'm beginning to understand how you chose, or as I recall, Annie chose the title of your great book, Communion. Yes, she did chose, choose it. Annie, this was Annie's thing, the, the whole experience. I would, the visitors would never have showed up in my life if I hadn't had Anne as my wife, because she was the one who was, who was there to bring understanding and knowledge and, and insight. She was the one who, who did it. And she said, you know, I never see a thing. And yet I think I understand this very well. I think I said, Annie, you understand it better than anyone. I think better than me. Certainly. I think better than anyone in the world has ever understood it. Um, and her mind defined the communion experience and the, uh, whole close encounter experience in so far as it emerges out of my descriptions and my thoughts and, and the way we think about it is really founded in Anne's mind first. Anne was the one who understood. She understood and she still does understand. It's not over at all. I think that she was heavily involved in the writing of the Jesus book. In fact, I'm quite sure of it. Well, Whitley Strieber, this has been a wonderful conversation. I had no idea when we first uh, sat down together where it would lead, but I am so delighted to be able to explore these very important emotional nuances with you. It adds so much texture to uh, my understanding of uh, the journey that you've been on all these decades. Why, thank you. Jeffrey, coming from you, that's high praise indeed, and I'm very grateful for it because it, uh, it you know, you, I love your show, and I'm, I, goodness knows, I watch so many of them, I can't even name how many I have watched. Uh, you know what I would like to do, if I can find it, yes, is leave you with a poem. Um, I write poems. It's called Thought Questions, and I think it's a good place for us to stop. Thought Questions. I think I thought, or thought I thought, or had thought. There were questions about that, too. Thought Questions, like, is thinking about thinking thought, or is it a thought, or was it? Then I saw the sun on the floor, I thought it was revealing dust, but it wasn't there. The thought crossed my mind as a cloud crossed the sky. I thought in the wind. What a wonderful note to end on. Whitley, thank you so much for being with me. We have to do this more often. We do, Jeffrey. It's lovely always to be with you. I so look forward to it. Thank you so much. And for those of you viewing, thank you for being with us. <laughs>